Obviously, the Heritage Centre, we started uh, with two huge photographic collections. Uh, a chap called George Scales, who lives in Scar lived in Scarborough, uh, passed away now, and a chap called George Cool in Edinburgh, uh, who was his friend. And both of them collected uh, photographs of ships, like people collect stamps or thimbles or plates for their walls. Um, and, and between the two of them, had over 50,000 pictures of ships, not just Scarborough boats, but oil tankers, liners, sailing boats, whatever it was. So both those collections were donated to us. So that formed the core of the museum, really, an amazing collection of images. And 14 years on, we are still scanning them and still indexing them. And it keeps our volunteers busy, like Matthew there, comes in bravely every week and does some scanning and, and indexing and things like that. So we've always got plenty of work to do. Um, but here I'm going to pick out a few more interesting things. I'm not just going to show you photos of old Scarborough. Um, and so I've sort of thought of this in order, roughly this order, the largest object, the smallest object, the oldest object, the newest object, the most dangerous object, the most valuable, the most delicate, the most beautiful and the most unique and the most unusual. So there should be something in there for everybody, hopefully. So, um, but I thought I would start uh, because you, you may have all come to hear about Churchill, <laughs> which is on the programme, wasn't it? Um, and um, so I thought, well, have we got anything to do with Winston Churchill? And these are the only two things I could find at short notice. Uh, so one is a picture of the Royal Hotel uh, that you all know in 1914 that was hit by a German shell. Um, and Winston Churchill stayed in the Royal uh, and there is a, uh, a room called the Churchill Room, so you can book that or visit it. And then on the right is the letter. Uh, I know you can't read the, the, the wording there. I've got, I've got a copy with me if you want to see the full thing. Uh, uh, a letter written by Winston Churchill after the bombardment of Scarborough in 1914, where he says, uh, you know, this act by the German Navy is despicable. And, um, you know... Winston Churchill came from a time, almost a Nelson-type era, where, you know, warships should line up gracefully and shoot at each other until one of them sinks. Um, and so Winston Churchill thought this firing on Scarborough, killing a boy scout and a maid and a postman and a shoemaker, um, was despicable. So he said, the German Navy will forever be branded as the baby killers of Scarborough. So they besmirch their, their good name as proper naval men. So uh, we've got a copy of that letter, obviously not an original one. But um, So they're my two Churchillian. You may know some other Churchill connections. So if you know some, come along and tell me later or, or email or something. So that's the Churchill start. So I'll start with the biggest object. Uh, and this is this funny pieces of wood here. Uh, which are the moulds to make a Yorkshire cobble. Obviously, on the coast here, we have a very particular type of boat, uh, which is, is uh, actually slightly Viking-looking when you look at it. It's got clinker-built planking uh, where they overlap, um, which is a bit like the Vikings used to have. And it's uh, sort of, uh, well, obviously pointed at both ends, like most boats. But uh, um, th these are the moulds they used in the Scarborough boatyard, down on the seafront up until 2009, uh, which is when the last Scarborough's last boatyard closed and the Maritime Heritage Centre opened. Uh, the sort of two coincided quite well. Um, and we also have the steam box. So we've got a, it's a big hollow box, like a tree trunk, uh, with a couple of tubes either end. So you feed it with steam and then you put a piece of wood in it and then the wood becomes soft and malleable and then you can bend it round these moulds to make a cobble uh, whatever size or length you want um, to, to, to match your needs. So there were cobbles that were made, sort of two-man cobbles, three-man cobbles and up to five-man. Um, and you may or may not know but boat building, uh, ship building indeed, uh, went on in Scarborough right from the 1700s when Britain's navy ruled the world um, uh, right up until well as I say uh, 20, 2009 really when the last boat was uh, put together here 
So we've got a long tradition of shipbuilding and boat building that has completely disappeared. But fortunately, the Maritime Centre uh, started. So we were given these uh, wooden moulds by the boatyard, uh, which then becomes a bit of a liability, because <laughs> you have to do something with them. Uh, they're obviously not very exciting to look at, so they're in our store in Key Street that we rent from, rent from the council, um, along with a lot of other models and bits and pieces that people have given us. I think we've got about 10 models of the Cutty Sark now, if anybody wants one. <laughs> uh, and it's not too, obviously, a very close connection with Scarborough, so they're, they're not too useful. But people like making the Bounty is another popular one, uh, the Golden Hind, uh, so we've got a few of those. Anyway, so that's the, that's the biggest object we've got that's in our store. Um, and the people there uh, on the left is Lindy Rowley, Faith Young, who used to write for the Scarborough News, and Maria Royal, who works for the Council Tourist Department. And they are the three ladies that got the Maritime Heritage Centre going. Um, Lindy is a fisherman's wife, lives in the old town. Uh, as I say, Faith used to write a column in the Scarborough News, and Maria was at the tourist uh, board. Uh, and they said, you know, the, the old fishermen are dying off. Uh, you know, we need to do something about that. So they started collecting things in Lindy's garage. And when that got full, they thought, wow, we better better do something, better start a museum. So uh, it, it's great, you know, uh, that it's not just all bearded men, <laughs> uh, ex-fishermen, um, running the museum. We've, we're nicely mixed, male and female, young and old, which is nice. So that's the largest object. So next one is the smallest object, and it's not the tea bag. <laughs> we, we do get through an awful lot of tea bags, um, but it's the little tiny thing next to it, which is a Bible. And um, obviously when you went to sea, uh, not particularly for local fishermen who may only be out for a few days, possibly a week, but if you were going on longer journeys, you had to take a, a medicine cabinet with you. Um, and obviously if you suffered serious injury or serious illness and all the medicines didn't work, uh, you might not make it home. So that miniature Bible, they could hold and read the last rites uh, on the ship with that. Um, and it's about, yeah, well, you can see it's smaller than a tea bag, which is amazing. Um, and that comes from this medicine chest, which is from the 1950s uh, and uh, joins the category of one of our most dangerous <laughs> artifacts. It's got some dreadful looking potions and pills in it. It's probably completely illegal now, I'd imagine. Um, it's safely stored away. Um, and I think the most ghastly bottle is that brown diarrhea mixture, which I, <laughs> I don't know whether that's to stop it or start it, <laughs> or whether it is it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's quite amazing. You know, you think you're at sea, that, that kit is all you've got to save your life. And there's Epsom salts in there. There's bandages, there's splints and things, but there's some very strange looking potions as well that uh, uh, we won't even open <laughs> to see what's in there, I don't think. So that, that fits into uh, one of the most dangerous uh, uh, artifacts we have. This was another one of our most dangerous artifacts, and this is a Shamuli rocket line gun. And, and boats and ships used to carry these um, and if you, you were sinking uh, uh, and another ship came along, you could use this to fire that box of string across to another ship, or if you were uh, stranded on the rocks, you could fire that piece of string up to the cliff or onto the shore. So there's a thousand yards of line in the box, and then the gun bit uh, is a hollow tube with obviously a pistol at the end, and then the item below it is the rocket. So that was full uh, with the box that came had been unused. So there were four live rockets in there with, uh, uh, with propellant. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Elon Musk would have loved to have got his hands on it, but um, it was very dangerous. So we had to send it away to a specialist engineer. There's only one in the whole country who lives in Wales and he um, uh, steamed the explosive out of the rockets. It was quite expensive to get uh, disarmed, um, but now obviously it's safe to have on display in the shop and we don't need a firearm permit. Um, but to trigger the rocket, you had shells. So that little red box, uh, like little short shotgun shells. So they, that's what would have been 
uh, fired with the trigger and then the, the heat and the explosive from the little shotgun cap uh, would have set off the propellant um, and then the rocket fires off. You can see the bit of line just coming off the bottom of the rocket and that's made of asbestos. So that is still a little bit dangerous, uh, but if you don't touch it, uh, wiggle it around too much, it's okay. Um, and there is a video, a brilliant video on YouTube. If you Google Shamuli rocket line, uh, somebody else was given one of these kits a few years ago and decided to see if they worked and fired them in the middle of a forest. And it's pretty impressive. Uh, it really is to give NASA a good run for its money. So um, that, that's one of our, was one of our most dangerous uh, items. This is one of our oldest items we've got, and uh, it looks a bit strange there, but it's actually a cannonball photograph from above, sitting on a, on a rope mat. And the cannonball came from the Subaqua Club, I think. We were given a, a, a few of them in a bag, one of the Subaqua Club members. Um, and this particular one we, uh, we, we covered in hammerite paint. I know it's not the professional <laughs> museum grade uh, uh, preservation, but we wanted the kids and the adults that come in to feel the weight of these things. I mean, they're very rusty. Obviously, they've been at the bottom of the sea and the harbour for many years, so very corroded. Um, but a couple of coats of hammerite, and um, you can pick this thing, well, you can just about pick it up. Uh, and, it, and you say to the kids, can you imagine that coming through the wall of your boat or your ship uh, and all the wooden splinters flying everywhere? Horrific, you know. It didn't explode. Lots of kids think the cannonballs exploded, but, you know, they just came through the wood. And, uh, of course, a lot of men died of gangrene and blood loss uh, because of that. So that's, that's probably our oldest. We don't, haven't got an exact date for that. Matt might be able to give us an idea, but I would imagine 1700s, 18th century, something like that. So that's the oldest one. Then we're coming on to what I think is our most beautiful artefact, which is the stained glass window uh, from the Conservative Club in Huntress Row. So uh, as you know, that's been turned into a premier inn now. Um, and when they were sort of converting it or trying to knock it down as they were originally, um, they stripped out, I think there were three stained glass windows. I think there was a World War One, World War Two, and then this one which is the town seal, um, you know, going back hundreds of years uh, when they sealed documents, they would have had the melted wax and a stamp uh, and it would have stamped that picture of, uh, of what Scarborough is. It's a castle and a ship, isn't it? And it still is today in a way. Um, and that's, uh, luckily we, we managed to save that from disappearing from Scarborough. It's the only thing we've actually bought, I think, a couple of hundred pounds we paid. And it was absolutely black when we got it because it had been in the Conservative Club and in the Conservative Club they'd been smoking cigars and pipes and cigarettes since 1888. So it was covered in nicotine and it literally took weeks and weeks of cleaning with fluid to get the black nicotine off. But now it sits in our back window with the sun shining through and it's absolutely fabulous. I think it's, I think it's one of the best things we've got. So that brings me on to one of the most delicate, or two of the most delicate objects. Um, and on the left is a Gansey that you'll all recognise, uh, like a fisherman's Gansey. But we believe this one uh, was on Scott's expedition to the Antarctic in 1910. It was handed to us um, by somebody that believed it was on show in a church in Scarborough. Uh, the church has now been knocked down. Um, and they believed it belonged to a chap called Edward Wilson, who was on that trip with uh, Scott to the Antarctic in 1910. Unfortunately, we don't have the provenance, we don't have any written evidence. What we can see is if we look back at the photographs of that expedition, the, the Ganses look very similar. It's the right colour, it's quite small, as people were quite small then. So it looks right, but um, if we got Fiona Bruce on it, she might be able to prove the provenance or not, I don't know. But maybe one day we will get that connection. And on the right is a white star line uniform that was donated by Andrew Clay from the Wood End Museums Trust. Uh, and that was handed down through his family. Uh, I think his great-grandfather was a milner. Um, and uh, it's got a few moth holes in it. But it's about 1920s white star line. 
Uh, and we had it on display when we had the Titanic exhibition, the centenary of the sinking of the Titanic in 2012, and then we had it again uh, in 2023. Um, so it was nice to have a uniform roughly from the period of the Titanic, and I'm sure you all know the other Titanic connections with Scarborough. I'm not going to tell you if you don't. <laughs> you can come and find out. But So we've got two very strong connections with the Titanic. So while we're on sort of clothing, uh, I thought I'd throw these in. We've got a lovely pair of uh, fisherman's leather boots, um, handmade, and they would have lasted a whole lifetime. They're extremely heavy. So you can, you can see why if a fisherman fell overboard, it wasn't worth him knowing how to swim. And even up till today, there's some fishermen still don't bother to learn to swim because they think it just prolongs the agony. It's better just to go under and say farewell. Uh, but yeah, those, those boots, if they fill with water, you, you, you'd... going to Davy Jones's locker, as they say. Um, and then on the right are the Gansey swatches. So we've got a Scarborough pattern Gansey on display, but there are Whitby patterns, Farley patterns, Flamborough patterns. Um, and actually just this week, if you follow Facebook, uh, there's a lady in Flamborough who's running a course on how to knit Gansies. It takes about 80 hours to knit a Gansy, uh, and you need four needles. You knit, knit them all at once, like a sock, like a tube, so there's no seams. So when you're working, it doesn't rub on your skin. So Gansies, yeah, quite particular to the Yorkshire coast, and we've got quite a bit of information on those. So next on is sort of, um, I suppose this is probably most precious to the family that gave it to us, really. And they're World War II medals, obviously. Um, I won't go into the full story with these. Uh, one of our volunteers, Jennifer, uh, has written up the story of the family. Um, and we've got some diaries as well, some fishermen's diaries um, and, and various bits and pieces around the war period. Um, obviously, with the bombardment in World War I, we've got artefacts from that, lots of photographs and, and, and books and things. And we've got quite a bit, few bits from World War II. And of course, now we've got Stuart MacDonald's book all about Scarborough and World War II. That, uh, Stuart's in Canada at the moment, so he's not here tonight, but um, that's on sale in the Maritime Centre as well. Next up is what's the most popular item which is surprising, it's a light bulb. <laughs> and people seem to love this. This is in the, in the window in our cabinet. It's 3,500 watts. So if you're electric meter, if you plugged it in, <laughs> you'd probably have a phone call from the National Grid saying, can you turn it off, please? Um, and it was in Flamborough Lighthouse. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many hours they lasted, but uh, it's quite an impressive thing. Uh, and it was donated by the Rotarian, the Wheel of Rotarian Society. And so it's amazing how, how people, I suppose, with everything going LED these days, you know, kids just won't know. I mean, they, kids don't know what a phone box is, do they? So what, how are they going to know what a light bulb is? <laughs> We're talking a funny language. Um, next up is an unusual item, which is this uh, bronze round object with a picture of a walrus on it uh, and it comes from HMS Walrus which is the ship shown there uh, that was shipwrecked in Scarborough in South Bay and it was a World War I Royal Navy ship um, and it was being towed uh, down the Yorkshire coast in 1938 um, to be converted um, but a storm uh, came up and it got washed ashore and it was actually pulled into Scarborough Harbour where they pumped it out um, and in fact it went for scrap afterwards but somebody, I think lots of people clambered over it and stole bits off it um, and so we've got that little round bit which is actually called a tampon rather bizarrely uh, and it went in the end of the gun barrels to keep the salt and the spray out of the gun barrels it's very heavy, uh, made of sort of bronze but quite an unusual object other unusual things, especially for young people, this on the left, for those of you who remember, it's a 12-inch vinyl record. <laughs> uh, I know they're coming back into fashion, actually, aren't they now? There's a record shop opened on Eastborough just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Farley Fisherman Choir, 
I think, I can't, are they still going? Are they? They're still going. I know they were struggling for a bit, weren't they? But amazing sound. Lovely to hear all the harmony voices alongside that little crackling we used to get with a record <laughs> at the beginning of each track. Um, so that's why we digitised that. So we've got it in, on, on computer now. And then on the right was a, a little object I picked up on a trip to Knaresborough. Uh, a few weeks ago in an in a antique shop and it's a Victorian glass slide we've got a half a dozen of them hand painted um, you know before television and cinemas and what have you um, Victorian Edwardian era and it would have been the Magic Lantern slideshow so each slide has a different scene uh, probably from the story of Captain Hook um, and that would have been uh, an evening's entertainment of, of, of still pictures one after the other. Um, I think they did later on have moving ones as well, didn't they? With little arms and legs moving. So they're quite unusual. Um, and at the same time in there's where I picked up uh, a little pack of um, cigarette cards uh, with uh, naval ships on. And it's a full set. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's weird, isn't it, to think that they... Uh, the cigarette companies were desperately trying to encourage people to smoke more. <laughs> they thought, how can we do that? Well, if you get a little card each time, you're going to want to smoke another packet. Um, and, uh, and so collect cards. So that's why they did it. And they were very, very popular. But you don't see many around these days. So it's quite nice to uh, have, a, have a set with the sort of uh, uh, naval theme. Um, we were given a few years ago by um, Scarborough uh, Harbour um, Master uh, the old log books and minute books of the harbour that go back almost a hundred years. So they record a lot of the boats and ships that came and went from Scarborough Harbour. There's also the committee meeting minutes where they arguing about <laughs> whether money needs spending or not spending. And it goes through both world wars. Um, there's also a fish landing book with the records of the fish, the weights of the fish landed. So that's quite an amazing set. Uh, it's not a complete set, um, but it's quite interesting. And we've had a few people researching information that have come to look at those. This one's a fun, fun object. So this is a Royal Navy rum barrel. Unfortunately, it came without the rum. Um, but obviously all ships used to carry these and uh, all sailors had a tot of rum every day to keep them happy and merry and uh, warm. Uh, it stopped in 1970 and our barrel was made in 1970 so it was never christened. Uh, if anybody wants to come in with some rum and christen it we'll, we'll share that with you. Um, and so all ships uh, on the oceans today are dry. So all the crews uh, are not allowed to drink on duty, which makes sense. Um, and you probably also know the story that Nelson, when he was uh, killed, uh, was put into the rum barrel to preserve his body. Uh, and if you see the size of this, I mean, it's about the size of a small dustbin. Uh, it shows you the size of Nelson at the time to have squeezed him up into the, into the barrel. This is a fairly recent donation. I think just last year, um, you'll know that Alan Booth, MBE, the town crier, passed away rather sadly. Um, and his uh, artifacts, his bell and his hat and his medals, and his MBE came up for auction. Um, and a, a, a local person bought those and donated them to us. So that's quite an interesting thing to have in our collection. Now, one thing you would expect to see in a maritime museum is ships in bottles, isn't it? That's you kind of you automatic assume that. And until a year or two ago, we didn't have any. <laughs> and then somebody came in and gave us one, and then we got another one. And people always ask, how do they do it? How do they get the ship in the bottle? Well, here's a photograph showing you how. You, sim <laughs> you simply climb inside the bottle and pull the ship through the, the neck. This is one of the um, items that was first collected by Lindy Rowley, and this is a walker's log, um, and it was found in a skip in the old town. It had been thrown out, it's made of brass, and it basically records your speed. You throw the propeller over the back of the boat, um, obviously rowing or sailing boat, 
and that spins in the water as you go along that spins the line and turns the needle so it shows you how fast you're going how many miles you've covered uh, it doesn't need any batteries it doesn't need any satellites it's amazing it just simply works very trusted reliable system about 1878 that was made um, we've got lots of other navigation equipment a decker navigator which was the first electronic location system great big electrical units with chart paper and needles and things on uh, we've got compasses signal flags all disc lamps all sorts of bits and pieces to go along with the maritime uh, theme these are unusual uh, this is scrimshaw so you probably know that back in the uh, 1800s 1700s uh, it took sort of three months to sail to america before steam came along so uh, it was pretty boring so you need something to do there was no whatsapp no TikTok. <laughs> so um, sailors used to scratch onto uh, bones or teeth of marine mammals um, and we were given these uh, i think they might be fake actually i think they might be resin i'm not sure they're real uh, ivory or uh, a bone to be honest um, i think there's a lot of fake things on the market now but it does give an example of what the sailors used to do and then only yesterday this arrived courtesy of scarborough sub aqua club uh, which is a, a soup ladle a funnel uh, a polaris uh, navigation needle uh, a sextant part and an unidentifiable thing in the middle <laughs> that we're working on and these come from a wreck uh, 1865 from the ss volunteer that foundered off of uh, not far off Filey brig was it uh, last right brilliant so um they very kindly donated those so we're now going to try and find out the story of that ship who were the crew, what happened to it. It was only built in 1861, so it was only four years old, wasn't it? It wasn't very old. It was a steamship. Um, uh, all the crew did uh, uh, get off alive, which is nice to know. But um, some artefacts that they've brought up, so uh, we'll be able to tell the story of that ship, hopefully, in a, in a, in a while. So, one of the ships that we should all know about, of course, is HMS Scarborough. Um, and we have some, some person took the badge off the last HMS Scarborough that was scrapped in the 70s. And we were also donated a tankard from HMS Scarborough as well. Um, but looking back over the years, there was more than one HMS Scarborough. In fact, there were nearly a dozen ships with the name Scarborough going right back to 1691. Uh, this information is according to Wikipedia, so I take no responsibility for its accuracy. Uh, we, we are going to investigate it one day with the National Maritime Museum and make sure it, it is right. It looks right, um, but um, it's quite interesting. You know, a lot of ships called Scarborough, captured by the French, recaptured, all sorts of things. Lots of interesting stories there that we'd like to tell about ships that carried our town's name. This is probably the one we talk about most in the Maritime Centre, which is uh, a ship that was in the first convict fleet to Australia and took convicts to Australia and was called the Scarborough. So that's the one we always mention uh, that was built here and, to, and sailed all the way to Australia. So that sort of impresses people. And uh, of course, there was also the Countess of Scarborough that was involved in the battle off Flamborough Head uh, with, the, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Americans, although it was a Scottish captain in a French ship, but um, it was technically the Americans. Um, and now there's a group in Filey, the 1779 group, that are, uh, are, are commemorating the Battle of Flamborough Head every, every year, uh, with the intention, of course, of 2029 20, being the big, big anniversary. So. Brilliant. We will look forward to that. That would be really interesting. Um, a couple of other ships called Scarborough. There was a sloop. And then finally, uh, the, the frigate that you can see below there that was scrapped in 1977. Uh, there was a side paddle steamer called Scarborough. And this was the, the trawler called Scarborough. 
So, uh, and then of course there's families in Scarborough called Scarborough as well, aren't there? So we should trace all these things, really. So that's a very quick overview of a few objects. I'm now going to look at one in a bit more depth because it's quite an interesting story. And I've called this a fishy tail or tail. So you'll all recognise these pictures of the tuna fishing or tunny fishing as they call it here uh, that took place between the 1930s and 1950s. Um, and it was a big game sport, um, but the local fishermen helped row the fishermen out into, uh, in, their, in their boats. Um, this is the Tunny Club uh, down uh, on Sandside. That's now a fish and chip shop opposite the Newcastle Packet. And you can see the gentlemen sitting around the fireplace. So it was for very rich men. This wasn't just you like your local fishing. This was some, some wealthy people that came to Scarborough in their yachts. Uh, to fish and catch these enormous tuna fish that were eating the herring in, in the summer as they swam down the, the Yorkshire coast. And this is one of them, Lord Baron Rothschild on his yacht in Scarborough. This is another one who people often say is John Wayne. <laughs> and he does bear a striking resemblance to John Wayne, but his name was Colonel Peel. Uh, and he was fishing in, in the 1930s. And this is probably the most famous of the Tunny Club members, Mitchell Henry, who caught uh, an 852-pound tuna fish, although it was disputed because the piece of rope holding it up was wet, and they reckon that weighed a pound. <laughs> so it was only 851, is the, is the claim. But he still won the record, I think. Um, there was one woman who fished, Mrs Sparrow, caught a £496 tuna fish in 1932. Well done for her. In a rather fetching raincoat. <laughs> uh, and this is our own Mr Rushton catching a tuna fish at the uh, Seafest exhibition a few years ago. Uh, slightly lighter £851 model there. But uh, as I said, the local fishermen used to row out uh, these, these wealthy gents and as you can see, he's sitting in the back of the cobble there and he's harnessed into the boat in a special chair because these fish, once they caught the line, would literally drag you overboard and drag the boat along. They were so powerful. So you had a special seat that was fixed to the boat and then you had a harness to hold you into the seat and then you wore a harness that held the rod. So you can see the, the rod is held by the harness um, as well. And it could take several hours to land one of these fish. They would swim and swim and you'd let a bit of line out and bring it in. And you basically wear the fish down until it gives up and then you can hook it and drag it on, on board on, onto your bigger yacht. So we've always known these stories, but we've never really had any artefacts, particularly about the tuna fishing, tunny fishing, until uh, last year when this chap came in from Newcastle. Tom Steenson, and he said, would you, like a, would you like a tunny rod and reel? And we said, well, yeah, probably. <laughs> and uh, we said, where'd you get it from? So he said, well, I had a friend um, called Sam Harris. Sam Harris is on the left, uh, and he was a DJ in Newcastle. Uh, they called him a silver disc jockey, and he was a, a senior citizen. Uh, and he did lots of um, talks about sea fishing and he wrote a column in the Fishing News um, and um, he used to go out and show this rod to various clubs and societies, raised a lot of money for the lifeboat uh, organisation um, and he was presented by, with his MBE by a chap, by the chap on the right who was a, a marshal from Dodge City in Kansas. I don't know why, but he was. So that was what we were told. It belonged to this Sam Harris. Uh, he had it, um, and uh, he'd passed away, so it was being passed on to us. And we said, well, OK, um, obviously Sam Harris was in his 80s, so who, who had the rod in the 1930s? And, and this Tom chap said, well, if you look at the rod, you'll see the initials ZG on the reel, on the little knob there. Um, and he said, I've looked this up, and this is Zane Gray, 
who was an American, um, very famous American, wrote westerns. Um, and he said, I think it belonged to Zane Grey. And we thought, wow, that would be amazing. But we also noticed a little initials on the rod that say WWD. So there was a bit of unsure which way we were going with that. Anyway, we looked up Zane Grey. This is a picture of Zane Grey fishing. And um, these are the fish he caught. Uh, and as you can see, they're absolutely massive. 785 pound bluefin tuna. Uh, marlin, uh, where's that? Tahitian striped marlin, 1,040 pounds in Tahiti. Uh, he fished all over Australia. 1,000 pound tiger shark in Australia. But what you'll notice is missing from the list is Scarborough. <laughs> so he wasn't fishing here, was he? So this was... Didn't, 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 it was getting fishy, <laughs> wasn't quite right. So we got hold of the Tunney Club records in Scarborough and we looked at those. Uh, and obviously Zane Grey wasn't on them, but a chap called William Walter Dowding was listed. Now, I, I, if, if I was him, I'd add the initials WWD, wouldn't you? So we thought that's got to be the owner of our rod. So um, we started investigating him. The, the rod and the reel itself was made by Hardys of Annick, and they were very, very expensive, very limited edition, made by royal approval. It's covered in uh, the, the feathers of the uh, House of Windsor and what have you. Um, so they were very expensive things. So we thought, this guy's got to appear in the records somewhere. He was a wealthy man. We must be able to find some records. So went to the library, courtesy of their free ancestry uh, connection and we found the Dowding family uh, and in fact uh, when you look for birth certificates and death certificates we found three people called Dowding um, but there was only one that seemed to fit the right bill because he was born in India and I had this feeling if you were hunting big fish you might come from India where you'd hunted tigers and elephants and other things like that. So we kind of followed on that tail, really, um, to, to try and lead us in the right direction. So uh, we thought, well, we can find out more about this chap. And we did. It's amazing, the internet, when it works. If you're a, a person that has a profile on, uh, in the world, uh, your ancestry is recorded uh, going back as far as 1540. So this is William Walter Dowding's ancestry. Uh, and it seems, I mean, he obviously came from a fairly wealthy family. Going back, um, he's, uh, one of his uh, great-grandfathers was Reverend Townley Ward. Um, and then it goes back to booksellers in Dorset, and then a surveyor of roads, and then back to yeomans in Dorset. And we thought, wow, that's interesting. I wonder what a yeoman is. So that's, this is all, there we go. Let's do that one. There's a yeoman <laughs> in, the, in the 1600s. And apparently they were basically sort of like a sheriff or a marshal. They were people with responsibility for the town, looked after toll roads and bridges and uh, a bit of law and order stuff. So he'd obviously had a long line of fairly wealthy, fairly well-educated family. So we carried on Googling and searching history. Um, and I found on eBay a photograph with the word, uh, with the name Dowding, uh, and this came up, and it said, uh, this photograph was for sale for about $10, and it said on the back of the photograph, Mrs. Dowding with her children, Caroline and Camilla. She's the wife of Captain W.W. W. Dowding of the Welsh Guards. Before the war, she and her husband traveled a great deal abroad, shooting and fishing. Their home, Western House of Queen Anne period, is at Western Corbett in Basingstoke. So this, we were obviously on the right trail now. So we found him, we found his ancestors, we found his wife, and we found his children. What else can we find out? A fishing website that said William Walter Dowding caught the largest ever uh, fish in New Zealand. And we searched a little bit on New Zealand websites and we found a photograph coming up of William Walter Dowding. So we had our man at last with a very large fish. Um, and on that previous slide, you'll have noticed that 
the other column, mentions Mrs. Dowding, who was a great collector of guns, shooter and collector of guns as well. So uh, you're getting a picture now of the people we're dealing with, the sort of family. So what happened to William Walter Dowding? Well, the inevitable, uh, he passed away um, and he's buried uh, with uh, a lot of the graveyard websites. You can find pictures of the gravestones, which is great. So then we thought, well, I wonder if we can contact his children uh, at all. So we looked up wedding, uh, marriage certificates for, for Caroline Dowding and we found her. And um, she was um, running a, uh, a, a, a garden in bloom in Farnborough, um, uh, where she's, uh, she's, she li she's retired. She lives in this house and she runs this lovely garden that is open to the public. So I uh, googled her phone number, gave her a call and said, hello, <laughs> I'm from Scarborough, I've got your father's uh, tunny fishing rod and reel. Really? She said, that's amazing. And we had a lovely chat and I said, we haven't got any pictures of him in Scarborough. She said, oh, I've got loads, I've got an album full here, I'll send you a few. So that kind of completed the story, which was really great. We thought, right, we've got the, the whole provenance of the rod and the reel and the person that fished with it and, and spoken to his descendants. So that completes the story. Not quite. <laughs> the um, Tom Steenson from Newcastle that had given us the rod got in touch with us and said, you know that rod I gave you, that reel? I said, yes didn't actually belong to the chap I told you it did. <laughs> so I said, ah, where did he get it from? He borrowed it from another museum. <laughs> oh, so it doesn't belong to you or, or, or this other guy, no. So anyway, Tom contacted the museum, which is the Hancock Museum in Newcastle, and said, look, Scarborough Maritime Heritage have got it. Um, that was the centre of tunny fishing in the British Isles. You know, can, can they keep it? And they said, yeah, okay. So that was few, that was a few moment. <laughs> um, and so Tom said, I'll make you a cutout of a tunny fish. So he made this lovely uh, cutout of a 800 pound tunny fish, which is up mounted in our centre with the rod and reel below it. So that kind of completed the story. But if it wasn't for the internet, we wouldn't have found any of that. It's amazing. But you have to be a fairly high profile person to have all that information out there. But it's incredible when it all comes together uh, quite exciting. So, very quickly now, uh, <coughs> just a, a very recent donation uh, was a book called The Globe Makers. It's just been printed and it's the story of a chap that wanted to give his father one of those lovely globes that he used to get in a wooden frame uh, that showed the world and found out you can't really get them anymore. Uh, there's a few antique ones around, very expensive. So he decided to make one. Uh, <laughs> And he enjoyed it so much, he turned it into a company uh, and he now makes them for people around the world. And they're very, very expensive, but it's a very interesting book, beautifully illustrated, lots of colour pictures. And that got me thinking, if we had a globe in the Maritime Centre, you could put your finger on Scarborough and spin the globe and you'd be able to see exactly what lined up with Scarborough, wouldn't you, around the world? And I thought, well, I don't need a globe, I've got Google Maps. <laughs> so what happens, I mean, people say, don't they, people stand on the South Bay and look out and say, what's out there? If you go straight across from the South Bay, what's out there? I'm going to take you there now. We'll have a quick, quick trip around the world. So um, the Earth here is travelling at 600 miles an hour and the circumference of the world from this... Uh, place on the go, globe is 4,200 miles. So we're going to head off across the North Sea and the first place we land is Germany and it's Sankt Peter Ording. So it's 367 miles across the North Sea from us. Uh, then you cross a few more towns in Germany but before we leave the coastal town opposite us I thought I'd show you got a lovely couple of lighthouses and then they've got something a little bit more exciting than Scarborough. <laughs> Willkommen! We have kite surfing, water sports and nude beaches from all over the globe. Well, we'd have nude uh, all over the globe, wouldn't we, if we had nude beaches here. So that's our competition, the other side of the North Sea. 
Anyway, you carry on through Germany, you go through Poland, into Belarus, so we're at the same uh, latitude, into Russia, well, if you could, obviously, um, 5,420 miles is the last bit of Russia from Scarborough. Then you have to cross the Pacific Ocean. And then the other side of the Pacific Ocean, you hit USA, and then you enter Canada. So you go all the way through Canada, quite a big place, into Quebec. And then the last bit of Canada is Newfoundland. So that's 11,200 miles away from Scarborough, going directly east. Then you have to cross the Atlantic Ocean, and then you hit Ireland, and then Newcastle in Northern Ireland, and then you bump into the Isle of Man, and then the Lake District, and finally Leyburn, Cropton, and back to Scarborough. How about that? Quick whiz around the world, staying on the same latitude. So I thought, well, while I'm doing this, I might as well look at the longitude, might I, as well? <laughs> Just, it's one of those things you can't get it out of your head, can you? So what happens if you go directly south? We are 0.4 degrees west of Greenwich. So if you head directly south, we're going to cover 24,900 miles, crossing 17,000 miles of ocean and 7,000 miles of land. So we leave the UK at Bexhill, and there's this beautiful picture of their tourist information and visitor centre. Look at that. <laughs> we should have one of those. Um, anyway, then you hit France near Le Havre, then Tours, then the Pyrenees, into Spain, and then hit the Med. So you cross the Mediterranean Sea and you end up in Algeria. Then you go through Mali, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Togo, back into Ghana, and then finally the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, and the next stop is Antarctica. So you go right the way across the ocean, round to the South Pole. So that's 9,969 9, miles from Scarborough. And the zero degree line from Greenwich suddenly flips and becomes 180 degrees from uh, Greenwich. It's the other side of the world. Um, and you head from there, obviously, to the South Pole. And if you keep going over the South Pole, you get to Captain Scott's hut at McMurdo Station, so that's on the same longitude as Scarborough. Um, then you pass through the Southern Ocean, passing New Zealand by about 150 miles, passing Fiji by about 90 miles, then the Bering Sea up to Russia again, a little bit of Russia, and then into the Arctic Ocean to the North Pole. When you get to the North Pole, you cross over the North Pole, come down the other side into the Greenland Sea, uh, and you're not far there from Greenland and Norway, uh, down through the Norwegian Sea, and finally back into the North Sea, and back to Scarborough, 24,900 miles. So there we go, you've gone north, south, and east, west, all the way around the world. That was all from a book about the globe. So that's, that's kind of a roundup of artefacts. We've got an awful lot more in the centre, so please come down and see us if you want. Uh, we're open 11 till 4, Wednesday through to Sunday. Uh, if you want to volunteer some of your time, we're, you're always welcome to come and spend a few hours with us. Um, we've also started helping the Civic Society repaint some of the uh, street signs. So these are artefacts not in our museum, but they belong to the town. And really important streets like Key Street, which was the original uh, you know, key side where the ships were launched and built, uh, was in a terrible state, as you can see, all rusty, you can hardly read it, and when they're restored, they look really nice, so we're helping out with that. Uh, we have a lot of videos on our website as well. Our, our artefacts are not just physical things, uh, they are also recordings with fishermen that have passed away uh, and people that have passed away as well, uh, talking about all sorts of subjects, superstitions, growing up in Scarborough, etc., and that really brings me up to today, where today we uh, put together the final Days of Anne Bronte exhibition, which opens on Wednesday. So please come along and see that. It's very interesting. One of our volunteers is setting up an Anne Bronte Appreciation Society in Scarborough. She'd like to do something, restore the grave or protect it because it's, it's wearing away. Um, and she wants to get more interest in Anne Bronte. So lots of books and information and pictures about Anne Bronte on show. 
in the centre. And then just very, very finally, I just want to dedicate this presentation to a couple of our old shipmates that passed away this year, Jim Spencer, Merchant Navy Man, and Tom Rowley, Fisherman. Thank you very much.